Hello and welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark, your host, and today I have two gentlemen on the program, and they're both from Faith Comes by Hearing. Uh, the first is Morgan Jackson. He's the Senior Vice President, and also Patrick Gozier. He's a sen- Senior Digital Coordinator for, again, for Faith, C- Faith Comes by Hearing. Now, Faith Comes by Hearing is an international 501c3 nonprofit organization that records and freely provides the Bible in languages of the world, in the languages of the world. Their website can be found at faithcomesbyhearing.com. Now, this ministry has provided audio Bibles in around 1,800 or so languages, and they're counting. Uh, They do so much more than that, which we'll discuss. And their goal is to work in partnership with others to see that the Word of God is recorded and freely provided in every language that needs it, by the year 2033. So uh, without further ado, welcome Morgan and Patrick. Hey, thank you, Tony. Looking forward thank to being you. with you. Absolutely. So I'm excited to have you gentlemen on, and I, I, I want to discuss what you do because it re- truly fascinates me. Um, so let's let's go back to the beginning or just an overview, I guess. Morgan, um, it, it, just tell me basically, what does Faith Come By Hearing do and how did it get started? Well, Faith Comes by Hearing is focused on discipling people through hearing Scripture. Uh, when you look at the Bible today in the church and elsewhere, we tend to try to get people to go into a corner, open a Bible, and read it privately. But actually, all Scripture was always heard. From the time of Moses, uh, everybody was illiterate. You had one copy of the Book of the Law, and so everybody gathered Deuteronomy 31, 9 through 13, they're assembled every seven years, and they heard from Genesis to Deuteronomy. And the great revivals of Scripture, whether it was uh, Joshua in the Valley of Decision, or Josiah when he called the nation together, or Nehemiah, were when the Scripture was heard publicly according to that command. And so in the New Testament, we see the same. The letters were written to the church. The church would assemble, gather, and listen. And so we have a reading tradition, but that tradition, only 70%, 70% of Americans don't read a book a year. And so we find in the U.S. that people need to hear. So we try to provide tools for them to listen. But primarily our focus has been internationally. Uh, half the world's population is functionally illiterate. So about 35 years ago, Wycliffe and Bible Society started coming to us, and we were working with the U.S., We were working with 50,000 churches in the U.S. a year, trying to get people like you and I to listen to the Bible in our cars as we walk in the morning. Uh, And that worked effectively. But as those audio Bibles started going out, Wycliffe and others were calling us saying, why are you recording the Bible for Americans who can read when I've got 90 percent of the people I work with can't or only 25 people that can read? We print Bibles and when we get them back, The pages are missing. We ask, where are the pages? And they said, well, pastor, you told us man cannot live by bread alone, and we can't read. So we tear a page out every day, put it in the soup, and we eat it. Uh, They told us that in Nigeria, they buy four Bibles when they build a house. Because if you build your house on the Word of God, it won't fall. So they push a Bible into the corner of the cement or under the cornerstones. So we found Bibles hanging from rafters to ward away evil spirits, sleeping on them to ward away evil dreams, but people couldn't read them. And so they began to say, can't you help us? So we began to do drama recordings of the scripture. And what we found was these 70%, 70% of the world live in what we call oral communities. So when you bring an audio Bible to them, it's very natural for them in the village to put it in the center of the village and for the whole village to come around gathering to listen to the scripture in their mother tongue. And when they hear it in their own language, there's this shock. Ah, God speaks Konkoma. Ah, God can address us directly. Ah, we don't need a translator to talk to God. He's from among us. So they thought God only spoke Spanish or Mandarin Chinese or English or French. And hearing it in their own heart language just became powerful. So we started about 50 years ago, it started uh, by my parents, who were Southern Californians. My dad came to faith in his uh, early 20s. My mom had been a believer. And when he came to faith, he was radical. 
just believed the Bible. Everything in it was true. And I read a book by George Mueller on answers to prayer and felt the Lord knock on his heart. He was a business guy and say, I want you to just follow me. Go wherever I go, I'll provide for you. So they moved four kids, 13-year-old, 12-year-old, and 11-year-old boys and a 9-year-old girl into a 1955 school bus that my dad converted into a uh, house car. Now, it was during the hippie community time, 68, so it worked perfectly. Uh, bunk beds that folded down into couches, uh, had a little space. Each one of us had a space for all your stuff. And so we traveled by faith. I wouldn't take offerings in churches, didn't tell anybody our needs. Didn't have any supporters because neither parents on either side were Christians. And so we went out and God provided. So for 12 years, they lived that way. For four years, I lived in the school bus with them, with my brothers and sisters. And so we got to see how God provided. So we went from a Naval Reservation in Kent, Arizona, hippie community in Cape Junction, Oregon, to a Hopi community in Tuba City and ended up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And that's where the Lord said to start the ministry. And so Faith Comes by Hearing, originally called Hosanna Ministries, started as a large cassette tape loan library, mm. 6,000 tapes, and the Bible was in it. And as the Bible does and should do, it eventually took over everything. So, so, Morgan, it's fascinating to me, and it, it should seem so obvious that uh, I guess most of the world isn't literate and, and they they don't read. And we've been blessed, I guess, in the West to be able to to be able to read a Bible. But I'd never really thought of it before. It, you know, I, I, we 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 send Bibles out, and when most of the 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 world can't read, they need someone to read it to them. But the idea of of translating it in an audio format. Is just fascinating to me, and I'm wondering why hasn't this been thought of before, or has it? Well, it, it actually started happening probably in the 80s when Wycliffe started finishing translations, and they ended up translating scripture, distributing them, and then you come back and you find the Bibles are actually used as idols. People can't read them, but they, they believe there's a power in the book, and so they need to have it, they put it somewhere, they worship it but they they don't know how to read it, and so they don't know what to do with it. And so once that started happening, then you had some people start to do some recordings, but the first recordings were single voice, very boring, and nobody knew what to do with them once they were done. So they would take the recording, it was on cassettes, 24 cassettes, and they said, mm, what do we got to do with it? Well, uh, we can't give it away free, so we'll sell it. Well, what will we sell it for? Well, people make a dollar a day, so we'll sell it for three days' wages, three dollars. Mm. So they sell them, and all of them, bam, are sold instantly. But then you go to the market, and you find they've erased them all, put Michael Jackson or other music on them, and they're, <laughs> they're, they've just made 20 bucks, and they want to buy a whole other series of cassettes. And so nobody knew what to do with the cassettes. So when we came in, we had done a drama recording of English and Spanish. And in oral communities, oral communities actually have what I would call a circular worldview. You and I, once you get to ninth grade, you, you change from a circular to linear, which means you think, think in lists and in lines. So something that happened 500, 600, 700 years ago has no effect on you because those people are dead. In circular worldviews, you, your ancestors coexist with you. So somebody who died 2,000 years ago can bring sickness and death to you today. Now, it's a little bit Jewish when you think about it. So when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, who was with him? Elijah and Moses. Now, the minute you say that, the question is, alive or dead? The minute you say alive, all kinds of things start going off. Whoa, what do you mean they were alive? Of course, then the story of Lazarus and the rich man. He was dead, but he was alive somewhere. <laughs> Abraham was alive with him. So you're going, Wait. and then later Jesus is saying, hey, you don't understand the power of God. God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jason. He's the God of the living. So then in Revelation, you see this 
group of people. And John saying, who are these? And he said, well, these are those that came out of the great tribulation. And they're saying, how long, O sovereign Lord, until you avenge our blood? Obviously, they're aware they're alive somewhere. So when in Hebrews, you say we're surrounded by this great host of witness and a Jewish thinking, those people are around us. They're, they're still aware and so in our thinking, you know, we're here and ain't nothing in, be, you know, it's just they're dead and you're in the grave and you don't think. So in an oral tradition, they're, they see what's happening this way. So when something is important to them, it will come to them in a story, a drama, in song. And so when you think about Jesus, 95% of the people during the time of Christ were illiterate. So, and the Jewish people, the most literate, well, most people groups had no literacy, zero. But the Jews had at least 5% of people that were literate. So when the scriptures came to these people, it came, Jesus told stories. So when we redo it and we do it in a drama, the first thing we found is it needed to be in a way that was interesting. So we did a drama, 180 voices, sound effects, music. So when they would hear it, if you just read it, that doesn't connect to them because they've never had something just read to them. If it's supposed to be interesting, it comes in a story. It comes to them in a way that says, this is important, hear it. So when you do the drama, they would hear it. But, but then the next question was, how do you get them to hear it? Well, we worked with nationals and the nationals began to tell us, hey, we're oral communities. We do things in community. And so you're looking at scripture and you start saying, oh, how does scripture command illiterate or oral or, or us to engage in the Bible? Oh, we're supposed to gather as a whole nation every seven years. And for eight days, we're supposed to hear for a quarter of a day the book of the law. Oh, then you look in the New Testament and you say all the disciples but one were known to be illiterate. How did they get the hearing? of the Oh, well. Paul says, pay attention to the public reading. Because in the synagogues, when Jesus was handed the scroll, that was the normal way. Nobody had, you couldn't take a scroll home. You couldn't afford one. And nobody would be allowed to. It was read publicly. And so you heard it. That's how Peter and the literate knew all the Psalms. Because they would memorize them. They heard them. They talked about them. So after the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they had one copy of the book of the law. And they thought, hmm, may not be a good idea that we only have one copy, right? Remember in Josiah, they had one copy that lost it in the temple, in the church. They brought the whole nation together to hear it. So Nehemiah, they started making copies so that in every synagogue they would have it so that it would be publicly heard. So as we studied scripture, we went, oh, hey, the, the scriptures talk about community. All the nationals we work with say, if you'll give us one audio Bible, the whole community will come together to listen. So what we learned is if we would challenge a community to listen together and we would give them an audio Bible in exchange for the commitment to listen weekly, not to an individual, but to the community, and then have somebody follow up to make sure they were doing it, it worked. You'd go into a community, you'd meet with the chief and elders, you'd say, hey, we have the audio Bible in Concomo. Would you like to listen? And the chief and elders would say, no, God doesn't speak our language. He only speaks English. No, 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 he, he speaks Concomo. Would you like to listen? So you bring out the audio Bible, push the button. And the one we have is called a proclaimer. Let me grab one. And it's loud enough for a thousand people to hear. So it's got a solar panel. So it recharges, the batteries recharge through wow. battery lines. So you put it in the village, and you push the button, it's like all sound in the village just goes, <laughs> nobody moves. Nobody really? twitches for 45 minutes. So just, and when you look in their eyes, you realize they've entered the story, which is what happens with oral people. If they hear a story in their own language, because of this circular worldview, they can't separate themselves. They actually join the story and it's, as real as if it was happening to them right then. So they will react because Jesus is speaking directly to them, okay. not just to a group, to them. People get healed, people get delivered from demons while Jesus is casting out demons. And so you're going, the first 
four or five years, I couldn't figure out what was going on. Jesus said this to me. I said this to him. Jesus, and I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Do they know that Jesus is not in the black box? <laughs> and the pastors would be like, oh, come on, Morgan. You know, of course they do. They, but there's a voice behind the voice that is Jesus Christ. And when they hear that voice, they can't escape. And what was crazy to me is all these people were coming to faith in Christ. What we were doing is we were preparing the audio Bible initially for discipleship. We found out that less than 2% of all the Christians in the third world areas had ever read the New Testament. So they were beating their wives, they were getting drunk, they were, they were going to the soothsayers, had idols. Then they'd be on church on Sunday after beating their wife, after going to this juju man, putting a curse on somebody. And we're like, what? Well, they didn't know what the Bible said. The only pastor was somebody who had a sixth grade education, never been to Bible school anyway. Somebody handed him a King James Bible, and he's trying to read one or two verses out of it and preach out of it. And nobody else can read, so they don't believe what he's saying is in that book. So when you put this down, they heard every word. And they would gather in community. They would argue. But what blew my mind is people would talk about the genealogy. When I started asking people, what, what story? So many people were coming to faith. I said, what story or stories caused you to come to Christ? And one out of three would say, oh, when I heard the genealogy, that's when I came to Christ. <laughs> I'd be like, what? One community said, oh, yeah, Morgan, the genealogy was so powerful that when we heard it, we created a song out of it. So we would go to villages, we'll sing the genealogy of Jesus, then we invite people to come to faith in Christ. Mm. And I'm like, what? So about 20 years ago, I was in San Jose with some Christian business guys, and I was sharing some stories, and I shared a couple of genealogy stories. One of the white business guys afterwards caught me. He was, he was just upset. He was saying, I know you think it's fun, to tell the genealogy story, but the genealogy has no value and you need to stop it. And so I was a little taken aback, but there was one African in the room, one black guy in the room, and he was from Zimbabwe. He jumped in to defend me. No, no, he says, you know, the genealogy is my favorite part of the Bible. And the white guy looked at him like he had two heads. He was like, what? And he said, no, no, you have to understand our culture. He says, in Africa, we don't care what school you went to. We don't care how wealthy you are. The only right you have to speak is based on who your daddy's daddy is, your mm -hmm. tribe, your clan, your genealogy. He says, I belong to an important tribe in Zimbabwe. I belong to a, a chieftain clan, and I am the firstborn of my father, who's the firstborn of his father, who's the firstborn of his. So whenever there's a traditional event that the whole tribe has to gather, we have to come. And when we come, the aunties of my father will teach all of the women our genealogy and song. Mm -hmm. So they will come out greeting us, singing our genealogy. Enoch, son of Zechariah, son of Enoch. And they'll sing our genealogy back 10 or 12 generations. And when we come to the center of the village, everybody will listen because of our genealogy. So all of a sudden I went, ah. Well, it's what was happening because in these villages, whenever you would push the button and they would start to hear first thing out of Matthew, it would be in their language, right? Shock. But then it would say, and this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Now in Africa, everybody knows Abraham because of Islam and Christianity. And David is one of the prophets in Islam. So everybody, the minute they heard that, they'd lean forward. Who, what is his genealogy? Are we going to listen or are we going to walk away? 14 generations to David, the village would just go silent. 14 generations from David to the Babylonian exile, nobody twitched. The quiet mm. was just palpable. 14 generations from there to Jesus, now nobody moved, nobody twitched. Because in Islam, Esau, or Jesus, is one of their prophets. Now they sit as a virgin, gives birth to a child. John the Baptist comes screaming from the world, repent for the kingdom of God is... And they're just like, because they know they're sin. America, we're like, we're not sinners. Africa, Asia, they all know they're sinners. They all know they're damned or they're headed for something. And they're scared to death. Then Jesus goes in the wilderness. 
And when the devil comes and says, listen, I'll give you all of these, these kingdoms, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, they do all this to gain power. They make sacrifices all the time. So they're leaning forward to say, yes, go for it. And he goes, get, you know, Satan, it is written. You shall love, the, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Well, they have all these other gods and goddesses. And they say, there's only one and him only shall you serve. And he leaves. Then he starts preaching the Sermon on the Mount. These people make a dollar a day. What's the first thing Jesus says? Blessed are the poor. <laughs> They're like, no, <laughs> blessed are the poor, blessed are the wealthy. Yeah. Blessed are those who mourn. No, no, blessed are those who rejoice and are happy. No, blessed are the merciful. No, blessed are those that don't have to. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemies. Bless those. In the next 15 minutes, he literally destroys everything they believe. Everything. But they have a problem. They want to reject him. But he has the greatest genealogy of anybody who has ever spoken. So his authority to speak is absolute. And so you have villages, people, 70, 80-year-old men and women who have served idols 2,000 years, generations. And in that one 45-minute time of listening, they will raise their hand and say, how do we follow this Jesus? Bring their idols out, they'll burn them. Hearing scripture in their own mother tongue. So the genealogy, that part of the Bible that you and I are like, ah, why do you start it with a list of names? For 70% of the world, that is the most important part of the Bible. Morgan, that, that's incredible. That's something I never would have until you just said that. I had no idea. Uh, but, it, it, you know, getting the getting the, 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 the gospel, the, the word of God into these languages, into their own tongues so they can hear them. Um, you've got something that's called or your ministry has something that's called uh, Vision 2033. It has to deal with the Great Commission. Can you explain that a little bit, please? Well, some key businessmen and, and women. Uh, the, the Green family, the Barnharts, all came together around this idea of translating Scripture in every language. So they pulled together the top 11 Bible translation agencies in the world. The Bible Societies, uh, Biblica, Wycliffe, Seed Company, Pioneer, and said, what would it take to get Scripture translated in every language? The projection was it was going to take a, the 70... 100 plus languages, the projection was it was going to take 150 years. And they said, no, no, that's not something we want to see. What would it take to do it sooner? And so for eight years, these business leaders rallied them, found out what the pinch points were, created software, created uh, libraries for all of the materials, created databases to know who's translating what where. And the 11 organizations who had already worked together, some began to cohesively work together. And they, about six years ago, set an objective uh, to end Bible poverty by the tw year 2033, to have a full Bible for 95% of the world's population, to have a New Testament translation for, I think, 99.8%, and to have at least a gospel for 99.99% of the world's population. So we received that five years ago because we were speaking to them and we said, they're all our partners. And we go, half the world is illiterate. And these last languages had no written language. All of them are illiterate and oral. And we had begun to do oral Bible translation. We had begun to, with Wycliffe, Seed Company and others, create a translation system that bypassed the need for a written text. They, the Wycliffe and others said, Morgan, we're only translating the New Testament so you can record it because nobody's becoming literate. We're only getting enough literate people to do the, the recording. Why do that? Why can't we just go oral oral? You got a thousand languages at that time. These people are trilingual, bilingual. If you have one of those languages, why can't they hear it in one of the close languages? They translate every day and will translate oral to oral. We won't have to go to print and back to oral. Just go oral, oral. That's the natural way. So we created a software called Render and started doing that. So we're telling them, hey, these people are, are oral. What are you going to do? And they said, we're going to work with you. <laughs> You're gonna, that's your job. And we were like, ah. So we went back and started looking at 
okay, if they did this many translations, could we do the recording? How many teams would we need? We'd need 50 teams. Okay, if there's 2,000 languages here, how many oral Bible translations would we have to do? So we created what we called Vision 2033, which was an alignment with illumination. So this movement called Illuminations. So they had set this. They had set the objective, and we came in behind this objective of the translation organizations to say, "We'll support that." And our vision was to record the audio New Testament in every language that has a New Testament, the full Bible if possible, and at least one portion of Scripture, one gospel in every language, and a gospel film, which is a full-length film of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We start with Luke which is a word-for-word -word recording, but the LUMO Project did these wonderful films about seven or eight years ago that were done in Morocco that are word-for-word. -word. And so we just put the scriptures in a more door. And so a film in every language, because many of these cultures have never seen a temple, they've never seen a priest, they've never even seen a lamb. So the ideas are hard to conceive. So if you have a visual of it, then they go, oh, okay. Because if you're in India and you hear a temple, you think of one of the temples with all of the gods hanging off of it. Or you hear a priest, you think of one of those half-naked guys with a red dot in their things going around naked. You, you don't know what you're hearing. And so when you see it, you go, oh, that's what it's talking about. That's what it's talking about. And so it makes it a lot easier. So our vision is by 2033. So 2,000 years after the death of Christ, the idea wow. would be. Could we complete the Great Commission? Matthew 24, 14. Matthew 24 is talking about end, wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, pandemics, things we're seeing, right? And it says the end's not yet because the gospel of the kingdom has to be preached to the whole world, Matthew 20, 14, 24, 14, and to every nation. And the word nation, there is ethnos, which means language, tribe, people then the end will come. And, and the Great Commission is the same. Go and make disciples of all nations. And the word there is ethnos, nation, tribe, language, people. So in Revelation 5 and 7, you see those same scriptures where John's looking out and says he sees this whole congregation of people, people from every nation, language, tribe, and people. So twice nation language, tribe, and people. So God's expectation is that we have to reach every... If you ever wondered, well, why hasn't Christ returned? Well, because there's over 2,000 languages, nations, that have not, don't have Scripture. Actually, it's about 3,500 that have no Scripture. People are working in 1,500, but 2,000, nothing. Don't have any Scripture. They've never heard the Word of God. They haven't rejected Christ. They haven't heard of Christ. They've never heard. And so you bring it in, they hear it for the first time, and they're shocked. It, uh, yeah, and I, actually that was one of the questions I was going to ask you about. Did it somehow tie into Matthew twenty four fourteen about, and then the end will come? But you just, you just answer that, and it really blows my mind, Morgan, that we're in the generation that, that more than likely will see this take place. And it, it's, it, it's mind blowing to me. And, and I know that, you know, I was raised with the, the latest uh, book about the end time events and they would have their charts and, and their timelines. And, you know, you would always get disappointed because it wouldn't play out the way that this Bible te or Bible prophecy teacher was teaching. But I guess we should look at scripture first before we make those prophetic uh, end time speculations, huh? Right. And, and I, you know, we're not saying that Christ is going to return at 2033. But what we are saying is that we could actually complete the Great Commission and have scripture in every language uh, by that time. And this is where Patrick comes in, because it also says in scriptures that the earth will be covered with the knowledge of Jehovah as the waters cut. Not might, not could. Will. And when in Revelation it talks about an angel was seen in the heavens going over the whole earth in every language, preaching the eternal gospel in every language, to every language, tribe, nation, people. Is that a satellite? So we're getting in a time right now, if I look in my office, I don't see anything. But my office, if I pull up my phone, is literally inundated with electronic signals, movies, 
conversations. It's like the water covering the sea. And so that's where Patrick and that team of Faith Comes by Hearing is trying to cover the earth digitally so that there's no place where anybody is where they can't open their phone, if they have a phone, if they have an internet connection, and get access to the Word of God. And then when they go away, for it to be on their phone and for them to be able to share it phone to phone. So we've created technology where you don't have to have internet. You don't have to have any cellular connection. The whole New Testament, audio, text, and video can be transferred phone to phone. Phones talk mm -hmm. to each other. And so all these communities among the stream poor have these Zender Share It apps. And so I'll, I should probably let Patrick talk about some of the digital. So that's so you have Air Force, you have the ground forces that are going out proclaimer, proclaimer, village by village. But we also have the Air Force that's covering the whole earth. Well, yeah, that's that, Morgan, that's a great segue to Patrick and what he does. And, and Patrick, if you don't mind telling us what's exciting, you're the digital guy at, at uh, Faith Comes by Hearing, or probably one of the digital guys. Uh, what's exciting you about the new technologies about getting this message out? Can you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, when uh, when people ask me what I do here at Faith Comes by Hearing, I like to say, you know, we're in our 51st year as an organization, and we've been recording scripture in all of these languages. And uh, it's my job to get those recordings to people in a digital form. So that takes a lot of different forms as the internet's so vast and wide, um, from social media to apps and uh, even chat bots and other, other things. Um, what's really exciting me right now um, is sort of just to bring it back to where Morgan started. Um, you know, the Internet can seem so isolating for people. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is is through these apps and uh, groups like WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, we're really trying to bring people together online to engage in Scripture um, wherever they are and in whatever language they speak. So, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot involved in that. Um, we have published, we have our, our great big app, um, called Bible is, which contains nearly every single recording we've done. And that's our big kind of flagship app. Um, and that's worldwide, but we, in addition have made over 800 individual, um, Android apps that have a single language or sometimes just one or two languages. Um, so this is this is really for those people who uh, it's they speak a, a minority language and it's even hard to navigate a menu to find their language. Hmm. You know, they they might not be literate. They also might not be tech literate. You know, with the Internet expanding so fast, um, they might have skipped over, you know, generations of technology and now they have a smartphone. Um, so. In those cases, they can just go into the Google Play Store and search their language, you know, Kikuyu, and it might be the only lang the only app that's ever been built in their language is the Bible. And uh, through these apps, then we can send out push notifications and say, hey, uh, this week we're reading John 1, and then come and join us in this WhatsApp group and discuss, uh, you know, what's happening there. And so we have amazing teams all over the world who are doing this ministry uh, specifically in their own areas and contexts and uh, just some super inventive and talented people. Patrick, the, you know, I, I, I'm, it, just, it just came to my mind a couple of years ago. I was watching uh, maybe a documentary about one of the South American countries and everybody in the scene was very poor, but they were riding a train. I don't know if they were going to work or what. And I, I started, you know, I was basically thinking they have nothing t to their name. Um, but all of a sudden, this very poor looking woman pulled out a cell phone and she had access to the Internet. And I was like, OK, wait a second. Um, in, in the most remotest regions of the earth now, folks have access to the World Wide Web, if you will. And uh, talk to me a little about that, a little bit about that, if you would, because you're the expert here. What is the the access capability, I guess, of folks in 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 a faraway land that they can access 
the web that they can access the internet. How, is that is that common or is is that uncommon still? Yeah, it, um, I think the statistics say about five billion of the eight billion have have good internet access. Good being relative, of course. It's not American internet access, but in a lot of cases, it's high speed. And um, I I have had the exact same experience that you just described. I had the privilege of spending about six months in India, and you know. You would see the affluent people with with good cell phones and good connectivity, but what surprised me was to drive by, uh, you know, these sort of shanty towns, and people are just living under tarps, but they have cell phones with 4G internet access. You know, I'm like, where are you charging this? But they're finding a way. Um, in fact, sometimes it was just strung together. Uh, <laughs> You know, extension cords. I don't know where the where they originated, but they were all sharing this power. Um, and so, in a lot of cases, um, especially in cities, uh, you're going to find one decent power and two decent internet, and a lot of people with cell phones. And uh, and you know what we're finding is is even people in in smaller villages who don't have good internet connectivity or maybe any connectivity, they will at least come into town once a week, once a month, and they can connect to an internet cafe's Wi-Fi. And um, so, so like Morgan was mentioning, uh, all of our apps that are on the Google Play Store, they also have an offline component. So uh, they can just, they can either, you know, if they're in a city, they can download the app and use it like you or I would, would use an app streaming sometimes or downloading other portions. But uh, in addition, we also offer a fully offline version that can just be d downloaded once. Maybe when that individual comes into the city, they download the whole Bible and uh, audio and text and, uh, and in some cases video. And then when they go back to their village, they can share that phone to phone through Bluetooth, something that doesn't require any connectivity, um, and yet they are able to share that full that full app. Um, sort of funny f for us to think, you know, these people have smartphones, um, but no connectivity. But that's just becoming more and more the case in so many of these places, and so they use it's, phones uh, very differently. Yeah. Yeah, they are are using phones as, yeah, Dang. they as sort of storage devices in some ways. And uh, what I like to say with these apps is uh, the Proclaimer has been such a good tool for us for so long and continues to be. And now with these apps, we've just turned every uh, all of these five billion cell phones into Proclaimers. Uh, you can have a listening group. You can hook it up to a speaker and now have the communal listening group that we've been uh, seeing such success with um, just from a phone. Well, Patrick and Morgan, as, as we kind of wind things down and, and bring the plane down for landing, talk about some testimonies maybe that stand out to you that have touched you, that folks that have heard the gospel maybe for the first time through the ministry that you're involved with. Talk to me and talk to the audience about what have you been moved by? What kind of stories have moved you and, and, and given you encouragement to keep going? Well, recently, one of our partners, Word for the World, uh, finished the translation. And when it was done, George, who's a Tanzanian, took that translation back up into the village areas uh, to be heard. Uh, came to a village and found an old man sitting in front of a hut, went up to him, discovered that he was uh, blind, had been born blind, estimated he was 94 years of age. And so uh, George started talking to him and said, that we've translated the scriptures, uh, the story of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, into our language. Uh, would you like to hear it? And the old man said, I've never heard of the Son of God. I've never heard of Jesus Christ. Yes, I would like to hear it. So they started with Mark, and as they listened, the old man uh, after some time of listening, turned to George and said, I want to accept this Jesus. How, how do I do that then? And so Patrick explained, you know, or George explained the plan of salvation and told him simply, you just need to pray and ask Jesus Christ for forgiveness, admit your sinner and invite him to come into your life, be your Lord and Savior. And the old man just said, I, I've never prayed. I, I don't know how to 
can you help me? And so George led him in a very simple sinner's prayer. And as the old man followed, suddenly he looked at George and said, I can see. While you are praying, I receive my sight. I can see. Oh, my gosh. So there was a lot of excitement. Later, the old man said, could you come tomorrow? I've never seen a sunrise. I, I want to see a sunrise with you. And so George agreed, came the next day. And as they're watching the sunrise, the old man is just weeping. And, and then he tells George, he said, last night I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw this door that was open to heaven. And, and I wondered, and I felt a sense of welcoming. And I thought to myself, did this door to heaven open for me because of the prayer I prayed with George yesterday? And George said, absolutely, the, the door to heaven has now been opened. And so he came the next day to, to see the old man and found that he had died in the night. And for me, that just, you know, you just see many are waiting to hear. They're illiterate, blind. It's not that they've rejected Christ. They just, like the old man, I've never heard of the Son of God. I've never heard of Jesus Christ. Maybe somebody said it in English, but... He doesn't understand English. He only understands his own tongue. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty powerful story, Morgan, and it, it certainly encourages me. And if someone's listening or watching the podcast on YouTube, guys, how can they get involved in your ministry? How can they support you? Well, I mean, one, we have this desperate need right now for proclaimers. We've been recording so many languages that you know, I'll send one out to a village and they call me up and they need 20. The 20 go out and they need 500 because everybody wants their communal. And, and the gospel has never been heard in their community. Uh, an example, you know, we just finished uh, recording an oral Bible translation of a people group and of 190,000. There's never been a Christian among them. There's never been a church among them. Um, they heard the scriptures two sections of scripture, the story of Mary and Martha uh, at Jesus' feet and Jesus calming the storm. Uh, there was they, This group had run into another terrorist uh, radical group and they had fled and now were in refugee camps. One person came to Christ. They helped start doing the translation. The translation team came to Christ. They took this sixth section on a proclaimer out. This family of 12, the, the mother was like this with her feet and arms, hadn't talked in six months because of the trauma. Mm -hmm. She heard those two stories, her hands opened, her feet raised. She stood up, how do I follow this Jesus? All 12 came to Christ. The first church in the history of that group was planted. Months later, they finished Luke, went to the king. He's only allowed to speak one language. They played Luke for him. As he heard Luke, he wept and accepted Jesus Christ. Demons came to him in the night. He rebuked them in the name of Jesus. They fled. He came and he says, I want all 190,000 of my people to hear. So the first thing is proclaimers. $157 provides a village or a community with the word of God. It's an internal device. I call villages that have been hearing for 12 years. And the proclaimer, they say, still works perfectly. Wow. So if, if Christ came back in 2033, let's just say he did. All the pastors gone. All the missionaries gone. All the Christians gone. And in Revelation it said, under the throne were those who were killed out of the great tribulation for the Word of God. How did they die for the Word of God? Well, they called this the Word of God on the black box. Oh. So the prince of the air may shut off the airways. Amazon, all of us. But right now we have 1.2 million villages with these. We can get 7 million out in the next year's. Every one of those communities, no missionary, no nothing, but the black box doesn't need power. will still faithfully do one thing in the mother tongue, play God's word so that others who are left behind may still come to faith in Jesus Christ. But during that time, people will come to faith and be decided. That's the number one. Number two, download Bible is and start listening to scripture yourself and then learn how to share it. When I'm in Bible is there's three little dots in the bottom right hand. And every Uber driver I know seems to be a foreigner. So every Uber car I get into, I say, hey, what country are you from? And then I go up to this upper place right here, and it says, 
Bible. And it, when I touch it, I'll push language. And then I'll do a search for their language. Or I'll go into a country. And they'll tell me the language. They don't know what I'm doing. I'll find the language. I push play, mark, and I put it over the, the back seat. And they will look at me like I came from Mars. <laughs> Where in the world did this go? How did you get my language, my Kesey language from Burkina? They're just like, and many times they give me the trade language. And they say, oh, that's the trade language. I said, what's your mother tongue? Play it again. They'll say, oh, that's my father's language. I said, what's your mother? And I'll have every single one of them. And they will just start. They'll, let, they'll be like, this is the most powerful day of my life. Doesn't matter their faith. And I'll say, can I share it with you? And at the bottom, I'll push those three arrows, those three dots. And it says, share it. I get their cell phone number, and I send it to them. That way, if I want to talk to them afterwards, listen to John, and let's talk. So one out of four Americans speaks a language other than English. Quit yelling and screaming about immigration. God, it says, moves people around so they might find him, searching for him. Why can't you be the person that instead of complaining, says, what language do you speak? Can I give you the word of God in your heart language? Patrick, what's the best way to, to support this? Uh, is it through the website or, or how, how can we support it? How can we give to these more, more of these black boxes in the Bible app? There, Patrick. I think we lost him. Okay. So, yeah, the easiest way is either just to go to the website, faithcomesbyhearing.com, or .org, I'm sorry, or just call 505-881-3321, 505-881-3321, and say, I want to provide a proclaimer, or God's word on a black box. And uh, we'll send one out to one of the villages around the world that's asking. Right now we have requests from 1.6 million <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, people really want the Word of God. And I, I, you know, when you go around the world and you find that you've got a prison, I just talked to a prison and they said, we've got three proclaimers and and eat, there's about 300 people in each ward. We're playing them in three wards. It's transformed those wards. But we've got 13 wards. We've got 10 wards where we don't have the Word of God. Can't yeah. you send me... 10 more. And then my guards are worse than the prisoners sometimes. They want to hear. Can't you send me five for my guards to hear? And wow. so we have all these requests. And Prison Fellowship International is in 116 countries. And they're saying, Morgan, you'll provide the proclaimers. We have the workers. We have access. We'll get them in the prisons. In Africa and Latin America, the schools have an hour for religious education. If we provide a proclaimer... The teachers have nothing. They will let all the students listen to the Bible for a half hour and have discussion once or twice a week in the public schools. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, Lord, I want to get every school with yeah. God's word. But it's just one. All I need is one per school, one per church, one per village. We're not talking about one per family, just one per community. Well, Morgan, and I, I think Patrick came back in here. Um, so, so guys, I just, um, you know, I want to thank you for coming on and talking about Faith Comes By Hearing. I, I encourage everyone listening or watching, if this touches your heart, go, go to the website, find out more about what they do, and watch the videos, read, read the articles, uh, download the app. But I just encourage you, this is worthy of your support, certainly. Um, and, and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you to hang on for just 30 seconds post-interview just to make sure everything uploads correctly. But uh, Morgan Jackson and Patrick Gozier, thank you, gentlemen, so much for coming on the program and telling us uh, what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And until next time.